morning once again. This is uh, the Sunday morning room on Japanese politics with Timothy Langley. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining. Today we uh, we are going to have this week's uh, digest of what is happening um, on the Japanese political scene and also behind closed doors. Last week we talked about um, the themes of uh, well, the Olympics, the uh, COVID-19, the geopolitical situation, um, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and also um, other countries in uh, the Asia Pacific region. And we also talked about the upcoming visit to, of um, Prime Minister Suga uh, to the US. Today we're going to continue talking about these themes and uh, because, well, Everything um, Timothy is going to tell us uh, is building up on something which uh, we talked about last week. Thank you very much for coming once again. Timothy, it's your turn. Thank you very much. So, um, good morning, everybody. This week I'd like to talk about five uh, broad issues. And rather than just uh, dominating the air and, and talking through the five issues, I'll, I'll break in between each of the um, topics and if you have comments or issues you want to add something to, um, let's go ahead and do that. And then um, at the end, I'll recap and then we can go back over it because some people jump in kind of after the, the conversation has started. Um, and before I get started, let me thank everybody for joining us last week and also for joining us for the Robert Whiting um, conversation on espionage, which was really interesting. And um, it was uh, recorded, I think it's being edited right now. It will be eventually uploaded to um, Japan Expert Insights uh, webpage, which is um, host, hosted or managed by, by Maya. So you can listen in on that again. So oh, the five basic issues I'd like to talk about um, kind of in a hierarchy are the Biden visit, uh, the geopolitical situation, uh, COVID, what's going on with COVID, the student administration um, and what's involved with perhaps elections or his standing or who's going to be the prime minister or what a snap election looks like. And then finally, the digital agency, which is um, going through a, a process right now. And as Maya said, you know, a lot of these issues are issues that we talk about all the time. So um, they're relatively few brand new issues. Uh, that just emerged because it's all a process, especially with regard to Japanese politics and uh, Japan's stance geopolitically and uh, bilaterally with the United States. So it's just a further development. So the more that you can attend and and get a, um, a bit of a breadth and, and historical um, pinning on uh, these issues, the better and the easier it's going to be to um, to integrate them and to talk about them. So let me go with the Biden visit. Um, he left on Thursday and arrived on Friday, uh, Mr. Suga, um, with a delegation. Um, they were greeted by Kamala Harris, the uh, vice president. It's somewhat strange. Uh, usually he's greeted uh, after arriving at the Blair House, and their first visit is, um, is not with the vice president, but she took over the uh, immediate protocol. And there was limited uh, FaceTime with, uh, with Biden, although you – you won't read so much of that in the press, but they do try and kick off, you know, a, a Yoshi and Joe relationship. But um, it just pales in comparison with uh, the kind of artificial relationship that was created for the press and and for just the the you know the geopolitical not the geopolitical for the, for the national consumption of each individual um, participant for for um, the U.S. president, for him to be seen as, you know, really active and engaged uh, with Japan and also for, and particularly for the Japanese president, whether it is um, Koizumi or Abe or Mr. Suga, that they are perceived as having this really tight, friendly, you know, I can call you up anytime kind of relationship uh, with the leader of the, the free world, the United States. Um, it does seem a little bit forced, and in the Biden administration, it is a little bit um, 
it seems strained, but they did have, you know, a joint communique where they talked about all of the important issues. Uh, top of the list was China. Um, they talked about climate and they talked about, uh, you know, semiconductors, the supply chain and defense. They didn't spend so much time on trade, which is a little bit worrying, um, but it's just this visit and a lot goes into it. So they can't talk about everybody. Uh, they do have um, uh, initiatives that are going on, but you might remember that um, President Trump uh, withdrew from TPP in 2017. And that was supposed to be a, a real a key pin between the United States and Japan for regional trade. Um, Trump walked out on it, just threw it away, and that left Japan kind of waiting. Um, and it took over the leadership of what became the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement on TPP in 2018. And that is in force right now. Uh, Japan went from 10% of uh, bilateral free trade agreements, um, you know, 10 years ago to about 80%. So dramatically, the the trade relationship has changed. So let's just talk about, you know, what the United States and Japan intend to do with China, um, what they're going to do about climate and their commitment to climate change. You know that um, uh, President Biden is really committed to uh, the uh, the climate initiative. He's put a lot of uh, money over a 10 year period into climate revitalization and the industries that will go with that. And um, so uh, we can expect a lot of action in that area. Interestingly enough, it's a, it's a two-day visit to um, to Washington, D.C. The delegation comes back, and then the prime minister has a two-day uh, climate um, uh, initiative that he's attending both days uh, on April 22nd. So the calendar is pretty tight, um, and from there he will leave and uh, have a visit to um, Philippines, uh, Malaysia, and one other country. It escapes me. Do you remember Maya? But he is going to take a, a regional trip. So his his um, his schedule is is building up. With regard to uh, semiconductors, um, his uh, administration has uh, earmarked money to bring Japanese companies out of China and uh, distributed through other parts of uh, uh, the region and including bringing them back to Japan. You might remember that, um, you know, 25 years ago, uh, Japan excelled in producing um, many components and finished products here. And that was pretty much hollowed out, um, which was in line with the declining population, the ability of the Japanese to export the technology, but still get the products shipped to Japan and globally, um, still with the, the Japanese brand on it. And that um, that style of manufacturing uh, looks like it has been channeled, challenged as a consequence of COVID, but also uh, because of the you know let's get out of China policy. Uh, defense is going to be a big issue, and it took up a, a lot of the time. There are things bubbling up there, and I'd like to transition from uh, just the defense um, component of it uh, because I want to get into it uh, in a geopolitical area. But um, that would be, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of detail on the, the Biden visit um, beyond that. But I'd like to open it up for questions or comments before we go on to ge ge the geopolitical aspect of Japanese politics. Anyone? And if not, okay. Did you say something, Maya? <clears throat> Okay, so Please, uh, if, just if, a moment. Sorry, Stephen. Ahead. Stephen uh, raised his hand, and I'm trying to let him ask. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry, let, let me just put my earphone because I'm not sure you can hear me well. I can hear you well. Okay. Yeah, I, I was wondering. Did you do you feel any um, uh, awareness in the relationship between uh, the, the new administration and? Uh, Japan administration um, since since uh, uh, 
you know, I mean, I know it's politics and the game of politics when when you have an administration, you kind of want to play by the rules and, and you know, kind of suck up to the current administration. And since, you know, we flipped from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, did, did you feel any weirdness in the relationship? Did you say weirdness? Yeah. Like awkward. weirdness. Weirdness abounds. There is, there is tons of weirdness. Um, it is, yes, it's, it's very, um, you know, the Democrats have been out of power only four years under the Trump administration. Um, and during that time, um, it was believed that the State Department was largely controlled by the Democrats in any event, which is why uh, President Trump had such a hard time. And one of the reasons why the... Um, I don't know how much you follow it, Steve, but the the activity of the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo has been rather um, muffled, um, not very active, not very vibrant. Um, and, and that is because, uh, largely speaking, the Democrats have ensconced themselves in the State Department very successfully and, and difficult to extract, even, even when you're the president of the United States. Uh, similarly, with defense, uh, the um, you can see it now. The uh, Defense Department is making lots of moves to accommodate uh, LGBT and um, diversity, equality, um, lowering standards so they can get more women. And you know, having the the flight suits, um, you know, accommodate uh, pregnant women, which is just I don't know, just weird in itself. And you remember uh, with. Um, the uh, visit of the defense minister, I'm sorry, the defense secretary of defense and the secretary of state uh, three or four weeks ago in anticipation of the Biden uh, Suga uh, meeting. The defense minister, a large uh, black uh, fellow by the name of uh, Lloyd Austin, you know, he was, he was on TV, he just looked awkward anyway, out of place. But he admitted it, it was his first time to, to visit Japan, which is almost shocking to have somebody of that stature um, be appointed as Secretary of Defense, and it's his first time in Japan. So it's kind of like, gosh, yucks, you know, uh, um, what are we going to talk about? So it's, it's, it's weird. Also, the, you know, it's so important for, you know, the, the leaders to be seen as friendly, but you got these two old geezers. And uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to, to, to feel like, what are they going to do? They're not going to go golfing. They're not going to slap each other in the back. They're not going to toss a baseball back and forth in, at Camp David. I mean, they're not doing anything. Um, and yeah, so it, it, it is a bit uh, disconcerting, but um, maybe maybe we'll grow into it. But I think the more likely prospect is that the civil administration is going to be a short-lived and... Um, Similarly, the Biden administration will be shredded and Kamala Harris will step into the role uh, in very quick order. I hope that responds. Yes, and, and also I have another question. You're probably um, going to talk about it later. In terms of cybersecurity, you know, um, since now the Biden administration is uh, hitting hard on Russia and, and, and the, the cybersecurity uh, in America, and uh, what about uh, Japan's stand on that uh, regarding um, the cybersecurity with uh, China and, and uh, the line platform um, and the politician using line platform for communication and the potential hack? Uh, do you have any, um, any information about it? That's really interesting. Were you on uh, last week, Stephen? No, I wasn't. I okay, wasn't. well, you get a demerit. But um, we talked about this a little bit last week. Um, uh, with the creation of the uh, the digital agency, which is one of the new initiatives of the Suga administration. And there are five main thrusts of uh, the creation of the digital agency, and first and foremost is cybersecurity. So um, I don't know what you do for a living, but um, in, in what in, in digitization of society or the the accommodation of, of, of a digital society. Everything will fall if you don't have uh, the cybersecurity part covered. You don't have encryption. You don't have, um, you know, anti-leak. You don't have anti-hack. 
if if there is a hole, then the whole s structure falls down. It doesn't matter how much you're um, devoting to G five uh, G or uh, data for conversion or cloud security, that sort of thing. So um, there's a there's a huge push for uh, cybersecurity. And the problem here is that uh, the Japanese don't have the uh, the intelligentsia that supports that. The United States does, Israel does, because of the military industrial complex and the fact that they train uh, these kind of specialists uh, while they're doing their uh, required military service. And then they um, they get out of the service after doing their required maybe four year uh, duty and they join um, industry. Uh, the Japanese don't have that. And so as a consequence, there is only a very thin layer of uh, highly qualified technical people who can deal with the the, the new uh, technology. A lot of that is coming from um, the United States and Israel. But, you know, one of the other problems is bringing these technologists into Japan with their families and helping them solve some of these problems. It's always, it, it's been a perennial problem with, with Japan accepting these kind of um, highly skilled people. So there is a gap that Japan needs to accommodate, but they're, they are identifying it as a the main issue. So, so, so at, at least they, they are uh, recognizing that, that that is a huge problem these days. There are two things that are going on. One, inside the Prime Minister's um, uh, office, they're creating a uh, defense intelligence unit, um, which is kind of funny because you would have thought that they would have had their own um, version of the CIA or you know, the, the defense uh, intelligence agency or something like that. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons why we held this um, really interesting uh, house uh, room last, last week on an espionage is because Japan really is, is lax in that area and it's an easy place for, um, you know, intellectual property snoops and, and industrial espionage uh, to occur here. All right, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Did you want to jump in, Dylan? I saw Mr. Langley on stage and figured I had to join. How are you doing? So it's good to see you. Doing great, great. Uh, so defense industry is uh, highly interesting to me, the security and the secrets, that whole world and the, the lack of depth here in Japan is astounding. Yes. Yeah. I didn't hear from the rest of the conversation. I'm not sure what to uh, talk about this to me. Great to okay. see you on stage, and the rest of you, I give you a follow as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So let's move on from there, if, unless somebody else has uh, something to say. Um, geopolitically, uh, you know, Japan is in a, a really difficult bind. And as we open the room, we talk about, you know, the issues that we talk about every week. We, we keep hitting them with just new information and new developments. And, and similarly now with geopolitics, the G Japan geopolitical situation. It's all tied up. Uh, it's just, it, let, let me just run through it so that you can begin to get a, a bit of a grasp of it. So um, the Chinese are coming down hard on Hong Kong and that is causing a lot of the Hong Kong needs to, to leave Hong Kong and go uh, particularly to uh, Taiwan. But a lot of them are coming to Japan as well and they bring their money with them. Um, but if China decides to move aggressively in Hong Kong, which it most likely is uh, scheduled to do uh, within the next probably two years. Um, this is going to call, cause a ripple effect. That in isolation is worrying enough, but nothing is going to be just by itself in isolation. We also have North Korea, um, which people thought the, um, they might fire a missile or something, do a test, while Biden and Suga were visiting, and thankfully they didn't. But it was an issue when Suga was talking with Biden about the, um, the kidnapping issue. You will remember that um, on record, there are about 17 uh, Japanese nationals who were kidnapped in the early uh, 2000s, uh, late 19, you know, 1990s. Um, there was a program of the, the North Koreans to kidnap uh, Japanese nationals uh, smuggle them away on uh, basically um, there, there are a couple ways that they did it. One was 
by using rubber dinghies to uh, submarines that were anchored offshore in um, in Akita or Aomori. Uh, they also kidnapped them from, from Europe and brought them into North Korea as kind of teachers or trainers of people who would later be infiltrating uh, Japan as Japanese nationals, uh, um, portrayed as Japanese nationals. So they taught them mannerisms, a way of speaking, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but North Korea is uh, poised to uh, do something because they have their uh, their uh, 50th anniversary of their creation um, coming up, and they always celebrate something there. The, the key a player there is South Korea, and South, the South Korean uh, Japanese relationship is uh, testy at best, um, and it's it's not uh, totally a, a reliable um, a collaborator when it comes to um, dealing with with North Korea or actually dealing with trade or anything, um, even the um, the supply chain. So that that's a delicate area. Uh, Taiwan, um, you know, we, we keep talking about this. Um, it's it's very worrying that the Chinese have been sending uh, incursion raids uh, through China, uh, through Taiwan, and also to the Straits there. Uh, the Japanese um, uh, government has also been scrambled uh, when um, uh, the bombers and the jets uh, fly into Japanese territory towards that. But it's not as serious as it is in Taiwan. So these incursions keep people on high alert. Um, you know, the, the defense minister, uh, Kishi, um, went to uh, Yonejima just yesterday to uh, reassert Japan's control. This is the farthest um, island in the uh, Okinawa uh, chain. Uh, it's very it's the closest uh, landmass of, of Japan's to, uh, to Taiwan. And um, deposited a contingent uh, uh, of Japanese uh, SDF soldiers. So this is this gradual escalation. You can see it building. Um, China has, um, you know, uh, changed the patrolling of um, the islands and the Senkakus uh, from the um, Chinese Navy to the Chinese. Coast Guard. And that's a significant thing because from the Navy, you can see that maybe it's a, it's protective, it's it's for, um, you know, protective purposes or defense purposes. But when it's shifted to the Coast Guard, then the suggestion there is that it's part of our coast, if you understand the, the distinction. And that's a distinction with an importance. So the Coast Guard is now doing the patrolling of, of, of these waters and, um, you know, harassing Japanese fishermen. And also uh, the Coast Guard has been uh, authorized with, um, um, you know, you know, shooting privileges to protect um, Japanese, uh, Chinese territory waters. So these are all very, um, very significant and, and worrying. Myanmar is still unsettled. It's tumbling into uh, total anarchy and civil war. How that is played out probably uh, the Chinese have a, a big hand in what the settlement of that is going to be, the Japanese less so. So um, there are a lot of defections within the Myanmar government with the embassy that's posted here in Japan. Um, they want the Japanese to uh, apply pressure and that pressure is not forthcoming, unfortunately, for the Myanmarese. So there's a lot of pain and difficulty there. There doesn't look to be an easy way out and it's probably going to be more painful um, as the days go by. And finally, just to, to lob another kind of grenade in here, we've got the uh, announcement of the release of the Fukushima water. I'm sure everybody read about that. And uh, this is really uh, in Seth, the uh, South Korean government who is trying to put together a coalition to um, evaluate and uh, protest the Japanese doing this. Um, this comes at a bad time for uh, the prime minister because elections are up. His election is coming up. The election for the upper, uh, the lower house is coming up, and there just seems to be no good news on the horizon. 
uh, a decision was made to release the more than 100 million tons of, of wastewater or contaminated water. Um, the good news there, and then it's not highlighted very, very prominently, is that although the decision was made to do that, um, it's it's not going to happen for the next two years. So when you read the newspapers, it, it seems like they're getting ready to release it uh, rather quickly. That's not the story at all. Um, so that's kind of uh, the situation that the prime minister in Japan sits in geopolitically. I'd like to close that up and open for any questions or comments. And if not, then we'll roll into COVID. Just a moment, we've got Sam. Yes, Sam, please go ahead. Hi, Sam. Hey, good morning, guys. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask on the last one about the, um, I haven't looked super deep into it, but what I've read about the Fukushima water thing, it seems like that's um, actually, I mean, again, you never really know, I guess, but it seems like it's it's actually pretty safe. Like they've, right. I mean, I, I've seen like nuclear scientists talking about it and they're like, yeah, I mean, if the numbers that they're reporting are accurate, then it's not a big deal. Um, you actually did ingest that and be totally fine. Um, it just seems like it's another example of this kind of like people just the backlash. Anything nuclear comes up, people just freak out about it. Um, but actually, it seems like that should have been good news. Like, hey, we're making progress on this. I don't know. Is that yes. am I off? Am I missing something? No, that's right. Um, uh, once you start commenting or, or um, writing about it, um, then politics comes into play. So different political parties have different interests and they will write and convey things uh, in accordance with those political philosophies. But yeah, I've, I've heard reports that, you know, using your iPhone on a daily basis is, is more damaging, potentially damaging to you than the release of this water to anybody. Uh, they'll be releasing it slowly under controlled circumstances. Uh, they say that the IAEA will have a permanent uh, monitoring um, post. Uh, that means, you know, probably, um, you know, some technologists from the IE, uh, uh, IAEA, uh, you know, posted in Japan, you know, they're part of the Japanese, uh, the, the, the foreign community here, their kids going to school, but it will be a permanent uh, mission to uh, observe that. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's inevitable. There's no other, I, mean, I can't keep collecting the water there. The storage is, has a, a, a capacity. They have to do something about it. It's just that, you know, it, it will destroy the uh, fishing industry in Fukushima because they won't be able, to, they'll be able to sell, um, you know, the, the food and produce um, in a limited region, but they're, they're not going to be able to export it at all. So, uh, Timothy, you went and had a lot of stuff. You went from Hong Kong, Taiwan, Straits, Coast Guard, which was, that, that's a lot to take in. Yeah. I'll narrow it down. I, I think that politically, it is tough to do anything, but I think it's really smart to say we're going to release this water in two years so people have a lot of time to either talk about it or also forget about it. So that's great. The China P, the Hong Kong Taiwan, that's probably the uh, the one I would pull it right on the most. If there is increased, I guess, uh, American idea that we're going to talk to Taiwan directly, the two part one party of the one country, two government system kind of fades away when we start saying hey, we're going to talk to Taiwan directly. China gets upset. Now what happens? There's um, so uh, we talked a little bit about this uh, last week, uh, Dylan. The, um, they've done war game uh, scenarios in the United States and in every um, uh, scenario that they played that U.S. loses in a confrontation with China over Taiwan. Um, even uh, Japan and the United States combined forces uh, to prevent something uh, all they can do is a, a bit of a stopgap measure. The Chinese economy is growing at, um, you know, year on year gross domestic product of 18%. This is astounding for a company, a country that, that that's that big and an economy that is that vibrant to be growing that much. So their Navy and their, their air force is, uh, growing uh, their, their Z is putting a lot of energy 
into uh, the defense capabilities. And I've heard um, people who know tell me that, um, you know, in, in our lifetime, there will be a conflict in this region. And it's, it's hard to imagine. One wishes that it's, it's a limited uh, contact, but the stakes are big. And so when you start to see, see and then the reason why these are all mentioned in, in the same breath, Hong Kong, North Korea, Taiwan, Myanmar, is because once it begins, once the, the, the chips start falling, it's likely to build momentum. So if China really does have an intention to make Taiwan part of the mainland, and it has said that ever since its creation, um, the timing is, is becoming ripe. So we have to watch that carefully. The, kind of the good news about that is that you can anticipate with China being the host of the 2022 Olympics, my God, that's just one year away. The um, 2022 uh, uh, Winter Olympics, that until that is finished, they probably won't take a hugely aggressive stance. But all of the probes and all of the, the, the feints that they're doing now is kind of anticipation of what potentially could come up in the very near future. So that's why it's something that we should look at. And even even small changes like changing from the the um, uh, the people's uh, um, the Chinese people's navy to the Chinese Coast Guard. Uh, these are significant issues. Hi, um, I just have a question about you know, like what your take is on the kind of develop potential developments for sort of alternate security frameworks in sort of meeting these challenges. Like um, right now, like there's obviously like a hub and spokes model with the bilateral security treaties. Do you think something like the the quadrilateral dialogue? Maybe the concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific, you know, to quote uh, Professor Minohara from Kobe University, is a bit of a talk shop for a long no. time. Um, sorry? No, I don't. You don't think there's uh, potential in that? Or could you clarify? Yeah, I, I think uh, Quad has got the Chinese uh, worried. Um, and the kind of, the, the Australians have a, a, a role to play. It's... Unfortunately, it's not huge, but the, the Indians do. It's just that the, um, the opportunity for, uh, you know, close bilateral relationships between uh, Japan and India are, um, are not very robust for a lot of different reasons. Um, but India is huge and it is, um, you know, it is already um, kind of identified China as a, a chief competitor. Uh, the key here is making sure that you know, the United States and India really bond, bond well. Uh, but it, it is a worrying prospect for the, the Chinese. But I think um, when you're talking about alternatives, and, and maybe Dylan has some insight on this or can shed uh, some light on it, I, I think more, um, maybe more potentially, you know, the Japanese, it's, it's just hard for them. It's hard to conceive them uh, building a, a really vibrant self-defense force and training the Japanese kids to do push-ups and to um, to remilitarize. It's I mean that 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 takes maybe two generations to do. They're not going to be able to do that in a um, an adequate time frame. I think the real potential is you you might remember that the United States launched a space force. So they had the Army, Navy, the Marines, the Coast Guard, and they launched um, space force, which is not getting a um, full support from the Biden administration, but there is something behind that. And the Japanese uh, quickly launched their own space force too, in collaboration with the United States. And um, I think probably the, um, the deterrence is probably rather than ground, it's um, probably more, more in space and in uh, space technology. Um, and defending, you know, uh, regional areas in a new, um, probably to us inconceivable way. Uh, it just takes a conflict to, to for this to be completely revealed. But I know that there's a lot going on that is not uh, public knowledge. Dylan. Okay. Particular topic. It's just my, my general impression, that's a very good point about it's interesting to consider um, space-based deterrence. My, my impression is that sort of the, the cost to entry, the barrier to entry, 
um, for like anti-satellite or anti-space technology based on like surface-based launch technology is, is a lot lower than actually developing some sort of a, a deterrence force or deterrence technology yeah. in orbit. Yeah, well, uh, let, let me add this one piece. See, the Japan is facing, well, yes, there is a lower birth rate. And so you'll notice things like the, when the coronavirus getting the blue, the blue impulse over to Tokyo, you'll see the self-defense polls on TV and regular popular shows build interest in range of the service. And it is working to an degree, but there will still a struggle. But I think what we're going to see is a shift, complete shift. You talk about that war gaming scenario where the self-defense force and the U.S. combined could not change the course of whatever China needs to do based on numbers. Mm -hmm. But I think we're going to see a paradigm shift. Uh, you'll start to see energy weapons you know, see being developed to the point where you don't need a force that's equal to the opposing side. And you'll be able to, with energy weapons, you'll be taking out multiple numbers, kind of like Star Wars, the laser beam flying in the sky. That's real. It's actually happening. They can actually take out things. They're just starting small drones and airplanes and satellites. And so I think that the idea that this is always going to be static also misses that the world is always changing. And geopolitically, there may be other changes that determine that, yes, it's still going to be one China, but let them run their own government. Like they're doing now, but a different yeah. uh, So nothing is linear just like we saw with coronavirus. It's really, really hard to read these things. The best we can do is plan, right? That's right. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and as as usual, you know, the United States is pretty good at a couple of things, and um, it's, it's pretty much accepted knowledge that whatever we are doing in contemporary uh, society, the military-industrial complex is about 20 years in front of us. They're doing things that we don't hear about we're not uh, privy to but in terms of of um you know defense capabilities uh they've got things that yeah and until they actually come into use you you just don't know about it and even when when that happens people are astounded so i think that's probably the better bet but with with china growing so quickly and being um Perceived as, as aggressive, they've, they've typically not been an aggressive nation, um, uh, you know, expanding their borders. But it seems like the, they've changed the strategy, and it is something that uh, we in uh, Japan need to worry about. Just getting back to um, the Biden Suga talks, one of the things that kept coming up is the um, the free trade in the Indo Pacific, so the the shipping lanes and that sort of thing. So. Uh, the fact that the Chinese are building the artificial islands and encroaching on uh, Japanese sovereignty and and kind of dictating, you know, what the territorial reach of, of their um, their land mass is, yeah, it does cause people to be concerned. So with that, I'd like to move on to COVID. COVID is hot in the news um, with uh, Mr. Nikai. I don't know if it slipped his tongue or if he's just uh, on some days and off some days. But on Thursday night, uh, he was asked about uh, the Olympics. And he said, you know, if it's going to cause um, more spreading of the, the COVID, we, we really should consider not having it. This is a bombshell. So everybody in the LDP has been towing the line that we're going to hold the Olympics. Uh, even though 80% of the Japanese population doesn't want to have the Olympics, we're going to hold the Olympics. And the whole reason here is it's just like, you know, it's just like everywhere else. It's economics. You know, we have spent so much. We have bet, you know, our our last dime that, um, you know, our, our bid for building or for expanding or for assuming a project or promotion of the Olympics, it's going to pay us big dividends. And all of these big corporations who have gambled – are now sitting there with um, an empty bag and wondering what's going to happen. And these are the big corporations who are uh, the biggest supporters of the LTP. So it has been said, we've talked about this before, that um, as almost difficult as it is to believe that, you know, Densu, he, the company Densu would, would probably go belly up at the um, Olympics are not held because the bank's so 
they thought it was such a guarantee that everything is going to be okay. They're going to purchase all of the, the advertisement. They're going to do it globally. They're going to make a lot of money. Um, so a lot of companies are in that, that same situation. So when you think about uh, the numbers that are going on in Osaka and the numbers that are in Tokyo, uh, Osaka is just, it's, it's, it's almost in panic mode. It is uh, the fourth wave has approached there. But there's no reasonable explanation of why um, the numbers are not reflected in Tokyo. Um, it's the same population. There's, you know, the same thing should be happening in Tokyo as is happening in Osaka, except for the fact that the Osakaans are a little bit wilder and, and like to, to party a little bit hardier, and they have most of the comedians in this country. But um, I think the the evidence is that the numbers have been kept artificially low in Tokyo to prevent um, more skepticism about the Olympics. Everything needs to happen uh, according to plan. And now with Nikai, that you know, he's probably number two in, in terms of political power in, in Japan, uh, maybe number one because he it was him that selected Mr. Suga. Um, but as soon as Mr. Suga gets on the airplane, Mr. Nikai you know, lets this drum bomb, uh, this bomb drop, it's um, um, pretty frightening. So if you're watching the numbers since then, uh, Tokyo, the Tokyo governor, Koike, is becoming a little bit more adamant about staying home. If they call for a, a third uh, state of emergency in Tokyo, that will probably kill the prospects of the, uh, of the Olympics. Um, Mr. Kono, Taro has already gone on record saying the Olympics needs to go on with no spectators. You remember uh, this time last week we were talking about 50%, and that was supported by um, Seiko Hashimoto, who is the minister in charge of the Olympics, saying that we can still hold the Olympics with 50% of the, the stadium filled. It should be okay. We're one week later, and now they're saying uh, no spectators. So this is an extremely worrying um, uh, development. With that, I'd like to drop the uh, the topic of COVID and open it up to questions. Can we stay on COVID for a second? Sure, sure. So it seems to me as I'm watching around the world, I mean, we're all watching, you get it from the TV on, you look at it, it just shows up everywhere. Why would Japan be so slow in rolling out one vaccination, which seems to really flatten the curve and two, testing. I traveled recently overseas Getting back in was a struggle. Uh, I took six PCR tests in the space of two weeks. And it seems to me that the speed of which PCR testing comes from the results is very fast. There's at home testing now you can purchase in kits. Why are we so afraid of testing? If you test the population and if you spent and started now, you can get through a large number. If you're going out, you get a test. Here it is. It's at home. If you're feeling bad, don't worry about that. Check the test. Look, it, you're probably a you probably have it. Please uh, take measures. Why are we not seeing something like that? And I don't think it's cost. Is there something else in that political spectrum? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, less than 0.8% of the Japanese population has been inoculated. Um, they started the rollout to the, uh, the geezer class, 65 and older, um, on Monday. Um, they only inoculated about uh, 1,200 people. Uh, the following day, they actually inoculated fewer. That's on the second day. Um, and the rollout is just, it's just like molasses. Uh, Kono Taro, who is, you know, he's got a lot to gain for this. He could become uh, the next prime minister if things roll out. He's been, you know, touted as the vaccine czar. And he can't get it going any further. So he, he seems to be actually an apologist on, on uh, the TV shows when he's on news. He looks good. Um, he is responding to questions, but um, I think his, his hands are rather tied. There are a lot of things going on that you already know about, Dylan, that the, the reluctance or the skepticism, skepticism of the Japanese population typically over um, vaccines is, um, is high. Um, and also, um, th there are some problems with the distribution of the Pfizer uh, vaccines 
from Japan into the um, local municipalities. And that's where it's going to be administered. Just last week, it's like, you know, give me a break. This is this is something you just found out. I mean, you remember the the, the problem they had with the, the the shots, the injectors. You know, they they can only handle five shots and uh, four shots and not five, and the vials are five right. shots. And how ridiculous is that? Now the new one is well, we don't have enough uh, doctors. You know, how, how did you just think of this? You know, of course you you're not going to have enough doctors to inject the number of people that need to go in in the United States. They would pass it off to uh, nurses and um, uh, pharmacists and nurses, dentists. Nurses, practitioners, farmers, right. trained, you, they've trained a lot of people. My That's right. In the U.S. is a vaccine. And, and in Japan, you know, uh, unless it's Novocaine, uh, you know, you have to have a, a you know, if it's a nurse, then uh, a doctor needs to be within five feet, um, you know, supervising that sort of thing. So it's just ridiculous. Um, you know, we, we've dealt with this before in in you know Japanese regulatory environment, but I think um, this is a somewhat cynical. But um, I think the Japanese really, really want to have production here in Japan. They don't want to purchase it from Belgium, ship it all the way over, and freeze it, and then distribute it. They want the IP to be here. They want the production to be here. They want um, you know maybe Pfizer to uh, contract with one of the uh, Japanese manufacturers, ASI or somebody like that, to produce it here so the technology stays here. It's the same thing with, with computers or chips or, you know, McDonald's hamburgers. Um, I, I think Actually, there is... I, I see that strongly. So if you, that's ever, everything, as you know, through history, but produce it here. But at what yep. cost of the Olympics? And as you mentioned, the Densu. So if you buy these vaccines, you get them started, the vaccination program isn't one and done. There's a lot of people here. You're going to continue. We can talk about that later, but it seems to be hidden below the surface. No, I think so how do we? They've already relinquished that. They even even with the very aggressive rollout, they knew that maybe you can get um, a lot of the older people. You get the first responders vaccinated. You can get a lot of the the um, high risk, the the people 65 and older um, before the uh, Olympics starts, but you're, I mean, we're less than a hundred days away. Uh, there's, you know, warp speed um, in the United States um, can work. It could work in Japan. Japan has that kind of structure, the top down, um, if they were committed to it, but they're not, they're not doing it. So uh, you have to draw your own conclusions. Dominate the stage. We'd love to see some other ideas uh, from the folks here in the audience. Great audience we have uh, present today. And Timothy, great, great room you've got here. I wish I'd found it sooner. Thank you, Dylan. Anybody else? Moving on? Okay. Uh, so it just gets more and more interesting. Um, let's talk about uh, Mr. Suga. So he stands at a 42% uh, approval rating right now. It's not bad. Um, it could be better. He will get a boost when he comes back from meeting Joe and then um, talking about, you know, how they bumped elbows and how, how meaningful that was. Uh, he will get a little bit of a, a push out of that. But at the same time, this time next week is the election of, um, you know, Hiroshima, uh, Nagano, and Hokkaido. That the, um, the LDP is just, it's not going to do, do well at. So he's got, he's got that coming at him. The Olympics in the fourth wave, hitting Tokyo, that's going to probably happen. So Golden Week starts in, in two weeks. And the greatest fear is that in Golden Week, everybody, you know, lets their hair down and takes off their shirt and, you know, has, goes to barbecues and returns back to the um, ancestral homes. Um, and I think that they are going to stop that. So between now and the beginning of Golden Week, uh, they will they will clamp down. That's going to hurt um, the prime minister. It's probably also going to hurt the Tokyo governor, but she is perceived as um, being on top of this, uh, on being a leader. She's on TV all the time. Um, she's reporting. I think she's doing a, a really stellar job. Uh, and I think the, the population 
also appreciates uh, what it is that she's doing in Tokyo. So um, in contrast to that, the prime minister who's got lots of other balls um, in the air, plus he's got people that are tugging at him because they don't want him to be successful. He's got that going as well. So um, let's talk just a little bit about the local elections um, in those three districts. So these are by-elections. They're seats that have become open over the last three months because the uh, then current diet member resigned or quit or died or something like that. And within three months, they're supposed to hold a by-election. So this is a barometer for how the LDP potentially could be doing or how the population in general feels towards the LDP. And this barometer is important because the prime minister on his own recognizance can close down the house and have a general election of the, up, of the lower house. He has to have a, an election, they're constitutionally mandated, before um, uh, September 21st. The four-year term of the members of the House of Representatives expires. So uh, the prime minister can close down the house at any time of his choosing. So if he's clever, he's not going to wait till that time. He's going to use it when he receives the Nobel Prize, and then he'll close down the house. Or the Olympics is a huge success, and then he closed down the house and says, see what I did? So help me vote for um, the LDP, all of my LDP members, and I'm campaign campaigning for them throughout the country. And then the LDP um, at least holds, maintains its, its uh, primacy in the lower house and its super primacy in the upper house. That's what it, it has right now. Um, unfortunately, the barometer is not looking good for Mr. Suga. So of the three, uh, Hiroshima, um, so the, the reason why the, the seat is open is because the upper house member was arrested for bribery, her and her husband, who was formerly Minister of Justice, if you can swallow that. So the husband and wife team were bribing people uh, three years ago uh, in elections there, four years ago in elections there. They got caught. Uh, the investigation ensued. Eventually, she was arrested. Then he was arrested. And she um, finally was uh, found guilty, and she turned in her badge. So someone to sit in her place is... Um, is the election on the 25th of next week. Um, the complicating fact here is that this is Mr. Uh, Kishida's region. Hiroshima is Mr. Kishida. He was one of the contenders for prime minister. He lost out to Mr. Suga. He didn't really lose out. He wasn't even a contender. But even if there's going to be a, uh, a race for prime minister, Mr. Kishida is always there. He's very influential in the LDP, but he's on the... Um, the downswing. So if he doesn't do well in Hiroshima, it will be blamed on him if the LDP doesn't do well. And it doesn't look like they're going to be doing well. Um, they've got an LDP a former bureaucrat who is running against a 40-year-old a good-looking former television announcer. And you know how those uh, deals usually go. Um, she's supported by the opposition party, and he's supported by the LDP. And um, less warmly by Komeito, who is very angry about the, the bribery scams, too, and doesn't want to get painted by that. In Nagano, uh, there is a uh, election for a minister who uh, – I'm sorry, a former minister who died of COVID. He was the first uh, member of the Diet to die of COVID. And um, his father was uh, Prime Minister Hata. So his younger brother is going to be running for his seat, um, but he is not representing the LDP. So he will get a lot of, what would you call it, the kind of um, commiseration vote. Um, and the LDP is um, uh, the basically said, you know, we, we will run a strong candidate, but it doesn't look like we're going to be doing well there. And in Hokkaido, Hokkaido is even worse. The um, former Minister of Agriculture was the diet member who was arrested for bribery by an egg producer. And uh, so that seat became open. It is so bad in Hokkaido that LDP is not even going to run a candidate. To make things worse, um, as important as this is for the LDP and for Mr. Kishida, uh, Mr. Suga is not even visiting 
uh, the region to, uh, you know, to scump for the LDP candidate in Hiroshima. So it doesn't look good. The prime minister's ranking will uh, still fall. And um, uh, the, the, the ability for the prime minister to have some sort of uh, silver lining and close down the house at his, um, at his timing doesn't look good. Uh, between now and the uh, constitutional time when he has to hold the um, lower house elections. The other complicating thing is that um, the prime minister's term of office also ends around the same time, just in October. Uh, this is an LDP rule where he is uh, serving the remaining part of Mr. Abe's term. So he has to go up for election. He can hold the House of Elections, uh, the, the lower house elections, and then um, if they do well, you know, um, hold his election for LDP president and thus um, prime minister. Or he could do the election for prime minister earlier and then the House of Representatives. He can uh, play with that a little bit, but the, um, the vectors do not look good for him. The best thing that is on the horizon, and I hope everybody's sitting down, you've got enough coffee in you. The best thing on the horizon is the emergence of Mr. Abe for one more shot at the prime minister's uh, position. And that looks like a growing uh, possibility and an attractive um, option for the LDP. Let me close it up there and see if there's any questions. It sounds like a complete surprise. Uh, the well, uh, Mr. Abe's uh, reappearance on the on the stage doesn't it? It really does. But when you look at all of the um, contenders, all of the potential people who could um, who could play that role, the the most attractive one right now is uh, Kono Taro. Uh, Mr. Suga is not looking that great. Uh, Monotar is looking good, but if there is an election for um, LDP president, the prime minister, um, since Mr. Kono is a member of the administration of Mr. Suga, if Mr. Suga runs, a uh, form dictates that he, he cannot run. He shouldn't be running against his boss. Uh, he would have to resign from the, the cabinet. And if you see that happening, um, then that's the play that Mr. Mr. Suga, he has heard or he has learned, Mr. Suga will run to uh, retake the position on his own, um, on his own, you know, historical um, victories or, or however you might portray him. He's going to run uh, for, for prime minister. And the only way that Mr. Kono could do that is by uh, resigning and being kind of a... Um, an opposition candidate. He is in the also... Uh, faction, you might remember, Mr. Asso is uh, deputy prime minister. He won't run for prime minister, but he, you know, it'd be better for him to have somebody within his um, his faction as prime minister, so that he can uh, play a role in the background and be uh, finance minister until uh, all of us are dead. The very end of your sentence. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hmm. Good morning, Hayato. Did you want to say something about that? Oh, no, I just want to, um, how much, uh, you know, my view is this, uh, you know, maybe you don't really care, but <laughs> yeah, so, you know, this uh, Mr. Abe is always uh, very stable, a strong alternative to any problem that's not performing as well, right? Because right. he was the longest serving, you know, the leader in a G7 nation in recent history, one of them, for sure, right? So, uh, and uh, Mr. Fono is also the part of the, the political, what is the legacy here, as you know? Dynasty, right? yes. Yeah, yeah, dynasty, right. So my, the, his uh, grandfather was my, you know, my father's uh, best friend. Right? So, so it's a, uh, so, so that, that's always going to be easy solution because they, they come, those dynasties come with a very stable, you know, backing, right. you know, and also the, 
poison is another dynasty, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's always a kind of a good, a good way. And uh, I don't know how Mr. Suga is going to do well, uh, as you know, he has not done well, right? Yeah, since he became the prime minister. Yeah, he's uh, he's getting unpopular. And uh, that's the biggest piece of uh, movies that uh, he's it's not just him, but it's more like you know Nikai who's backing him, or yeah. you know. So so uh, Nikai is uh, has a uh, dementia that you know. So his health has been deteriorating, deteriorating, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. So that's the kind of question because if Nikai Nikai is going to start, you know, keep slowing down the way he has been, you know, Mr. Suga's day will be numbered, you know, so it will be backed by this other guy, you know, who are in perfect health. So that, that's my kind of overall view. Yeah. Yeah. So um, watch this channel here, and as Hayato said, you know, the the dynasties have such a huge role to play in Japanese politics. So although, um, you know, getting into Japanese politics and, and being familiar with what's going on, um, it's, it's somewhat reassuring that the parties don't, the, the players don't change that much. And even if they change, it's usually their son or their wife or their daughter who is playing that continuing role. So it, it pays dividends to learn people's names, learn their heritage and their background and what their role is because Japan is, is controlled by, you know, hereditary uh, politicians. And um, finally, so we're, we're kind of running beyond time, but I wanted to talk about the digital agency because there's been some some movement there. So um, if there's nobody else that's, you know, clicking off and on on your, your microphone, then I'll move on to the digital agency and then we'll recap and then open the floor up one more time, okay? So the digital agency, it is, it is rare for the Japanese government to create a new agency. Koizumi came in and he uh, actually compressed the agencies. He, he joined them together. He shrunk Japanese government. He made 18 agencies where there were 26 before uh, ministries. Um, and um, in doing that, he shifted the power balance, because you remember maybe 20 years ago during the Koizumi administration, before that actually, the bureaucracy had so much weight and so much power and so much um, um, guidance to the Japanese economy and also geopolitically as well. And that shift, that long shift back into the, um, the, the diet, to the members of the upper house and the lower house, but more particularly into uh, the um, vessel of the prime minister's office has been um, a steady march, a very successful march. So creating a new agency is a pretty big deal. And uh, the Suga administration, as soon as he was launched, he started um, plans for the digital agency. And he was hoping that by launching this, he would have a, a great bouquet of flowers to present as an achievement in his administration. And so people would vote for him and think he's a great leader. He didn't stop there. Um, amazingly, he has uh, launched yet two new agencies. Um, you might have heard of one, but you might not have heard of the other. The, the second one is the Ministry of Caring. This is a ministry to account for and, and approach and, and deal with the startling number of suicides that occur in this country that we all know about. And the second agency is the Agency for Kids, Agency for um, uh, Taking Care of Impoverished Children. This one was launched about two weeks ago by the um, old guys in the loud suits, LDP, um, and it's almost um, transparently an election move. Let's show the population that we care about them and that we care about children and these old guys who really, uh, you would have a hard time being convinced that they cared about anything uh, like children, but that's what they did. So um, these, the, the digital agency in particular, but uh, the Ministry of Caring and the, uh, the Agency for Taking Care of Impoverished Kids are, are building up for this lower house election and also for the election for prime minister. Um, the digital agency is a, uh, a a composition of six bills that have passed through the lower house of the diet 
The sixth bill contains about 60 um, revisions to existing law so that they can so, so the digital agency can do things that it it doesn't have authority to it's not um, authorized to do and now it would be able to do that and uh, it is now in the upper house it got stuck in the upper house so in the lower house the LDP has a majority in the upper house as a super majority the prediction was that it would pass the lower house and quickly go through the upper house and become law at around the time that the uh, prime minister was coming back from his uh, visit to the United States successfully. And that he, in, in conjunction with the trip, the successful trip to the United States and the launch and the passing of the bills of the digital agency, he might close the house um, before the Tokyo Olympics, uh, the Tokyo uh, municipal elections on July 4th. Well, it's hit a snag and it doesn't look like it's going to be out of the upper house until May, uh, mid-May at the earliest. So that kind of takes away that pool for the uh, prime minister because if he closes the house, any bills that have not been passed, they disappear. And uh, the house goes for an election. The lower house is reconfigured. Uh, different posts are uh, reassigned. There's an, a realignment. And then the bills are resubmitted into the diet. So this this flag he wants to wave about, about, you know, the digital agency would disappear. So we can pretty much guarantee that the prime minister is not going to close the house um, uh, before the digital agency bill is passed. By then, he will be in the window of opportunity that the Tokyo governor has extracted from the LDP not to run a um, lower house election two months before the municipal elections in Tokyo. So he would fall into that zone. So then you've got the Tokyo municipal elections, then you've got the Olympics, and then you have the uh, lower house uh, registered constitutional deadline for, there's just so little time. So he's between a rock and a hard place. It doesn't look like that's going to move anywhere in his favor. In any event, the digital agency is still on, um, on the board. It will be launched. It's supposed to be launched on September 1st. So if it's launched on September 1st, it's a flag that he can wave uh, at some point. Um, but it looks like that will be delayed, too, because of the delay that's going on now. Um, the agency has already hired uh, 200 people from the uh, public sector. Um, um, it's got uh, a budget for hiring uh, 2,000 people. And it will uh, occupy, interestingly enough, um, uh, four floors of the building where Yahoo is in Akasaka Mitsuke, if you know where Yahoo headquarters is. So a nice, beautiful building. The ministry, the digital ministry, interestingly enough, will occupy the same building, four floors uh, in the same building as uh, Yahoo Japan, which is just interesting. I, I don't want to speculate too much on that, but... Um, if you are launching a new agency, you have to put them somewhere. The building already has to be in existence. So it's it's a, a real neat trick. I visited the Ministry of Caring on um, on Friday. It is right across the street from the Prime Minister's office, a brand new building that was um, slapped up in maybe 10 months. So, uh, a lot of uh, forward planning is required there. Let me close it there and open it up for um, discussions on the digital agency, if there are any. And uh, go ahead. So, you know, Timothy, it takes me forever to get uh, the screen. He's gone blank, open up the phone, find the app, put on the mic. I uh, apologize for the late little gap there. That's okay. We're waiting not... with bated breath for a little bit of pearls, pearls of wisdom. Tumble out of your, your mouth, Dylan. They, Thank they you. always happen when it's on mute, though. You, you realize that as soon as the mic's on, <laughs> it's just back to me again. Those pearls of wisdom, I'm just rapping right at the mute button. So I'm not familiar with the digital agency. What are they uh, supposed to do, and what is their real charter? Can you? Uh, so I'm not, I'm not going to tell you because this is your first time. You should have been here last week, and so I you have to have. suffer. You you have to suffer like everybody else. The digital agency, 
the digital agency um, is um, dedicated with the concept that each of the ministries has its own IT infrastructure, it has its own IT policy, it has different words for the same thing in each of the ministries. And they don't want to share that information with anybody else. Any bureaucrat that belongs to the Ministry of, of Defense or the, the Legal Affairs Ministry or to Trade and Industry, they have their own address in an email that's on a server within this agency. Okay, they, these are complete silos. So the direction of the a digital agency, get your head around this because this is huge, is to take all of the agency, all of the, the ministries and compress them into one format, the one protocol, one encryption device, one way of servicing um, uh, the, the general population and also interacting with each other. So you remember this um, this scandal that Mr. Suga's son had with the um, uh, Ministry of Communications, this kind of, you know, the, the whining and dining and who's, you know, who's spending their time where and how, how are they spending their evenings, that's all obvious uh, within the various ministries and they protect themselves just like <clears throat> Japanese companies do, Olympus, Nissan, et cetera, et cetera. So they want to break that. So you can imagine how hard that's going to be, but that is the direction They've earmarked a lot of money for it and a lot of authority in Mr. Hidai to achieve that. So the first thing that they're going to tackle is my number. They're going to actually streamline and uh, embolden um, a my number so that it is actually useful and easy to use. And it contains biometrics and it's a totally encrypted, bulletproof, that sort of thing. The second one is um, getting rid of Hanko, um, the Hanko system. Um, that's probably the two successes that they will have in the first two years. Um, and then Konotaro was talking uh, just yesterday about um, this this love affair that the Japanese have with fax machines, especially the, the bureaucracies. You know, please fax it in. You know, that's a additional three steps that you don't need to take. Um, and and uh, moving off of the reliance on faxes. So this the, the launching of the digital agency is absolutely huge. I love all the pluses. It's about time kind of thing, but I'm also an evil person. I'm just thinking all I need, instead of having keys to each agency and trying to break into all the servers around and get information, all I do is get into this one place and I'll have everything I need. I'll have everyone's personal information. I'll have the keys to all the kingdoms. I can impersonate people. I'm yep. excited. So um, we, we actually started um, the, today's conversation with um, cybersecurity. I think it was uh, Sam that asked something about cybersecurity. And with the digital agency um, of the five baskets that they are focusing on, the top one is cybersecurity. So uh, you, you probably remember that Japan has won the war um, for this week on uh, supercomputers. So it has a, a supercomputer that has uh, performed the, the highest number of uh, computations. Um, and that will probably last until China, you know, juices up uh, their supercomputer. But uh, encryption and um, uh, how, how to protect the information, you're absolutely right because they did that with Windows, you know. Uh, Apple is a little bit easier uh, or a little bit um, more secure because it's not as uh, prolific as a Windows. So all of the hackers go to the Windows because it's it's a a, a better gold mine if you can um, figure out the keys to um, to hack. But um, yeah, the that is a big deal and and it it's going to require some real super brain power. Yeah, if you open up the Windows Apple comparisons, I get all excited. Windows did a great job of being compatible all the way backwards to very, very first Windows. And so there's all kinds of holes in the software, whereas Apple every few years just said, we don't support the old stuff anymore, catch it. Mm -hmm. That's just because they have a chance to rebuild from scratch every few years. Mm -hmm. No one else does that. That's, uh, that's pretty amazing. So there's old, old Windows machines running electric plants, uh, running some of the manufacturing services. They're just isolated computers still running Windows on screen or who have you. You stick those on the net because it's convenient, and boom, someone's got to tell you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, you know, this cybersecurity thing is not a little deal. This is no, it's it's not. Uh, than one, anybody of the, can tell. No, one of the the problems that the Japanese government faces is although they have this ambitious plan, who's going to do it? I mean, they don't have the bureaucrats to do it. So when they decided to launch the digital agency, uh, they realized that, and so they put out a a job position uh, in the economy. And they said, look, if you're working for Cisco or Google and you have these high capabilities, uh, technical capabilities, um, join the digital agency. You know, you can work here part time. You can be seconded from your your current um, uh, position. We might give you a job as a bureaucrat once the agency is launched. But this is highly prestigious. And, um, you know, you can use your skills. You can contribute to uh, Japan. You can be a patriot at the same time that you're earning money. Um, and and that's where they they hired the the first 100 individuals and the, the rest are it. high risk it, low reward wonderful yes yes um, uh, the the rest of the um, bureaucrats are seconded from other agencies. Well, Timothy, you are as wealth of information. You you have spanned perhaps uh, every topic that's important in one short show. Uh, I'll be back again next week. Thanks so much. Thank you. I, I generally just make it up as I go along, but thank you for thinking it's it's useful. Oh, oh hi. Let, let me make uh, additional info, important information there. So, I, so they are in the same building, Yahoo headquarters, right? That's so right. The meaning the Yahoo owns the line, de fact. They have management control. So there's a communication that comes to the with the line. Well, what's going on? They have, uh, they they know everything in it, right? So uh, I like other important points. Yeah, because most of the Japanese here communicate through line, right? Yeah, so now they, they, they got it. <laughs> okay, so so line and Yahoo merged. I think everybody knows that story. And then um, there was a leakage of uh, several uh, Chinese technicians. I believe it was in uh, Shanghai. And that story broke about two weeks ago. The Japanese government now has uh, restricted um, access to line. And so none of the Japanese bureaucrats are, are using line anymore. And as that filters out, um, I think people are dropping from use of line um, elsewhere, too. So it's a huge hit to uh, Yahoo. And um, the, the fact that the digital agency is housed in the same building as Yahoo, uh, there's no relationship there, although it is very suggestive. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, do you have any other questions? Anybody who is uh, well in the listener section, would you like to, to talk with Timothy? Yeah, I have I have one question, okay. if you don't mind, Maya. No, please um, go ahead. So it, it's uh, with regards to the again to the cybersecurity and and uh, what uh, Timothy is talking about right now, um, espionage and stuff. So you know, in my line of work, in terms of digital marketing. Um, I don't know if you, I wanted to know about uh, the regulation in Japan with regards to software such as uh, Alfonso or Alexa. I don't know if you, you, you know about Alfonso. So basically, um, most of the devices um, originally was built on television uh, and even the phone. So you know that uh, your device is continuously listening to you. And the, the, way, the way Alfonso works is that um, as marketers, we are looking for keywords in a uh, uh, con conversation that you may have um, in your car while your phone is off or in your living room while you're watching TV or even not watching TV. And, uh, and uh, during those conversations, we're looking for keywords so then we know what kind of content to, to send you uh, in terms of advertisement digitally. So, and I've been trying to look at um, information with regards to Japan's stand on on both kind of uh, software and uh, AI going mm -hmm. on. And and uh, did you have any information about that? Because uh, I don't read Japanese, obviously, so I don't know if I can find any articles about that. Okay, here's here's the key takeaway on that, Stephen. Great question. So, in in um, Establishing the digital agency, one of the things that they want to do is they want to use existing services to the degree that they can without um, compromise. 
uh, compromise of security. So they will be using the cloud. They'll be uh, relying on AIS, um, uh, Amazon Web Services, um, uh, Apple, uh, what is it? You know, th there are several out there, Microsoft, uh, Google. They will be relying on those as, uh, as transporters of uh, digital information and they will store the information in um, uh, secure government-owned uh, servers and uh, data data farms. Um, and there is anticipation that new devices and new technologies will come out of this push, but it's going to be five years, um, six years before this begins to, uh, you know, whittle down into the economy. It's going to be two years before they really start um, getting traction. But one of the um, other things that they have decided is that for somebody who is um, generating uh, data, consumer data or personal data in Japan, let's say your your Apple or um, Netflix or something like that, they are not going to allow you to uh, patch batch the information that you collect on Japan from consumers here to wherever, Arizona or New York or Brussels or whatever, and then do the crunching and the analysis there. They're going to force you to do the number crunching and the analysis here in Japan. And the information that you have generated from Japanese uh, people and from the consumers here is remains in Japan. So you, you would have to have a subsidiary here. The information, the data would have to stay here. And if you are um, supposed to be producing an analysis of that, that analysis can be sent to the headquarters in a foreign country. So this is pretty big. This means that now you've got um, companies that need to have uh, their own data farms here. This is actually pretty clever. Um, have their own data farms here and their own technologies, their own technologists, their own, um, you know, pretty um, medium to high level um, corporate guys who are, are doing this work and then um, doing the analysis to send just the analysis to uh, the home country. So I think that responds in part to your question, but it, this, this push is really, really huge. And you would think that the Japanese would have come around to it years ago. They haven't. They missed the boat on uh, 5G. Uh, 5G. And they have decided that 6G is not going to be like that. We are going to dominate in 6G, and we are going to make Japan um, a digital hub throughout the region. It is going to be the shining light for how things should be done. And everybody I know on this room is shaking your head saying, yeah, we've seen this before, and you were going to do the same thing with, with making Tokyo a financial center and you know that sort of thing. But this time it is it is – significantly different that put a lot of money into it. The, the Suga administration has um, put its um, its credibility on the line. So I, I do think, and, and Japan has done this in the past where they have exceeded expectations and they've pulled themselves up and they've done something truly magnificent. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of hope here. So as a private company, you're, you're most likely going to have to keep the data locally here in Japan. That's right you are um, not able to actually sell the data outside of Japan, basically. That's right. right. That's right. Okay. Right, can I jump in for a sec on to add a comment and a question to Timothy there? Thanks, Sam. Great. Um, so, yeah, just also um, related to what Dylan was saying about the kind of security um, of the different, the different agencies, um, right? So far, they've been leaning on what they call um, security through obscurity, right? which is just like if everything is different and kind of difficult to understand, um, it, it's just basically more secure because it's a pain in the ass to get through it. Um, and I think that my, my view is that it's, it's highly unlikely that there hasn't been some kind of catastrophic breach at one of the major agencies, um, especially kind of related to what you're talking about, about espionage in Japan and just knowing um, I've worked in recruitment a little bit for some, um, cybersecurity people, and it's uh, there's no there's very very few people here who can actually um, manage that stuff. And uh, I think uh, yeah, so I, I just to kind of circle to my question, 
I think that as, it's very likely to me that once the digital agency is up and running and they're they're looking around what the other agencies are up to, they're going to find that there has been at some point a catastrophic data leak and that some large pool of Japanese citizen data has been lost by the government to some, you know, hostile actor. Um, and I just, I'm wondering, you know, do you think, obviously there's always a risk of this, but, you know, how, how material do you think is the risk that the digital agency will be defanged so as to prevent anything like this and ultimately be rendered, you know, basically just a, another sort of abortive attempt to, to transform um, versus, you know, do you think that their mandate is really powerful enough to push through that and say, you know, we're going to dig up all the dirt and, and actually do something? Uh, I feel like that would be rare, but I'm curious what your take is on that. Um, frequently I'm asked, you know, um, Nikai waited for um, Suga to get on the airplane before he let out this, this bombshell. And um, Nikai put Suga in the position he's in now. Maybe he's out of favor. And uh, Langley, what do you think that um, maybe Nikai is going to try and orchestrate the Biden-Suga meeting as not a warm success, but actually as a failure, so that um, his position is increased, uh, Nikai's position is increased, or Suga's position is decreased? And my answer to that is similar to the answer to what you've just asked now. Nobody wants uh, the U.S.-Japan relationship to be uh, harmed, to be uh, uh, less robust than it could be. Matsuyama Hideki, who won the, uh, the Masters just last week, was one of the first things that Biden talked about. There is a great desire for there to be a, an affinity between the United States and Japan. And similarly, with this, um, the digital agency, nobody really wants it to fail. Um, it's maybe the bureaucrats who are, um, they're covetous of the, the power that they have and the information. I mean, it's just part of Japanese business culture to hoard information and to not share information and to, to keep things um, oblique and, and mysterious. Um, but uh, I think the younger generation understand, uh, especially if they travel anywhere in Southeast Asia, you know, digital money is ubiquitous. And um, uh, 5G and, and the interaction of consumers with, um, with uh, you know, stores and shops and, and um, garments and, and consumables, um, you know, the Internet of Things is beginning to take off. I think it's it's very appealing. You know, Toyota has decided that they're going to take the first stab at this smart city. They've uh, um, revamped a uh, former uh, factory at the foot of Mount Fuji. They're going to create this showcase of what the future could be like with um, people interacting with devices and living in the communities where uh, the, the carbon footprint is uh, as close to neutral as possible and life is easy and uh, work is uh, pleasant. So there's there's a great push to achieve this. And I mean, look at everybody else in the G, G7. You know, Japan is a laggard in so many areas and the Japanese are just sick and tired of hearing that. Let's figure out something. Let's try women. No, forget women. Let's not do women. We tried that, um, you know, women shine. So um, uh, maybe digital is, is really the, the flavor of the month, but this is, I think something that's got good legs to it. Plus, they've put a lot of money to it. They've put billions of, of dollars into this uh, initiative. So it has a, a good chance of, of taking hold. It all depends on leadership and intention, right, as, as with anything. Yeah, I can definitely see, um, especially for, like, infrastructure or, you know, private sector supporting kind of activities, it definitely makes sense that it'll kind of have legs. But I guess... My question was maybe centered more on this sort of government, meaning public sector piece of it, um, and especially if Suga doesn't make it through after the election, and um, you know they start poking around it's in the bureaucracy, and uh, they're not uh, finding things that are favorable to the bureaucrats. I guess just the balance of power there is something that I'm not super good with. Yeah, well, plays out. no, there definitely will be a fight. 
uh, they will not want to relinquish, um, you know, somebody else accessing their information. Um, it's like, it's like when you go to a doctor's clinic or something like that, <clears throat> uh, the Japanese government wants to digitize that so that that information can be shared with um, hospitals close by or with the health ministry. And uh, these clinics and doctors and hospitals don't want to do that because the information that they've generated as a consequence of a visit by a patient, they consider not to be the personal information of that patient, but the personal information of the clinic or of the hospital. And they don't want the Japanese government to swoop down and pick up their information um, there in capital letters. Um, so it's it's a fight that is going to uh, take a, a long time and a lot of convincing. So it's going to require leadership, strong leadership. And that's typically something that is um, uh, uniquely lacking in Japan when difficult things need to be done. But they did it in the 64 Olympics. Um, they did it... Um, certainly because there was a lot of money to be made in construction and in the LDP and Mr. Tanaka, but still, nevertheless, they achieved it. So the, the dream is that Japan will, uh, will do it too. And I mean, they have all the attributes of being able to do that. It's just so starkingly um, curious that they haven't been able to do it. They, they're still stuck with hankos and Japanese banking, you know, being in the, the 15th century and, there's just so, so many things that are incongruous about Japan being a digital society or being highly technical, you know, among all of the, the G7, you know, the Japanese, they, they have the lowest amount of recalls of cars, of products, of, of, of consumer deliverables uh, of anybody. So there is competence. There is a high degree of skill that, that goes into it. But gosh, when it comes to these these other issues, what in the hell is going on? Oh, hi. Can I jump in to ask to, to some question or to sure. answer? Right. Yeah, so, you know, uh, so like the Japan is setting up a digital agency, right? And also Yahoo is there. So now like uh, that became the center of all the, you know, digital information in Japan, right? So from the intelligence point of view, it's kind of easy, right? Because uh, anybody who's going to access to that particular physical location or uh, on online or personally to any people working there are going to be the smart, right? Yeah, so it's very, it's like a hanging a bait in 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 uh, for fishing, you know. So for that, like it it, it makes it like very simple, easy, you know, because uh, all, now all you have to do is watch, you know, who's going to approach, right, and track down and to see who is behind, what you know, who's trying, you know, try to undo what they are trying to do, right. So it's very very easy. Yeah, yeah. So for them, like it's an easy play. I mean, that's how I see, right? Yeah, because now everybody in the world. Going to access digital information in Japan is going to try to get those, those agency or people in it, right? And it's in one building location, Yahoo, right? And the government agency in one location. So now all we have to do is just watch what's coming to the building, right? And whenever those guys leave to so the or this, uh, you know, the nightclubs, you know, Chinese yeah. clubs, four house, you just need to follow them, right? Yeah. See who's approaching them. So it's very easy, you know, to make it very simple. Yeah. And that's well, yeah. It, it, right. If you're trying no, to get the information, this is a single bait, you know, makes everybody work a lot e simple and easy. So um, uh -huh. that's a great observation. We, we kind of need to wrap up this room pretty soon, but I wanted to touch on that. It's a great observation, Hayato, and it always comes up, you know, uh, espionage and spying in spite of my last name. It's not, you know, it's not my specialization, but whenever we talk about Japanese politics and and the, the things that we talk about in this room, espionage and and uh, that sort of thing that you're talking about now always comes up. So as a consequence of that, you know, we listen to what the audience says. And so we hosted the espionage uh, room last week with Robert Whiting. It was really interesting. And it went on for actually two hours. Um, we recorded that and it will be uploaded soon. But the espionage, you know, Japan has widely been known as a playground for budding spies and even people who are um, typical businessmen from the United States or Israel or, or England or South Africa, you know, you're kind of in a, a, an intelligence gathering um, position in any event. You're trying to, to break into this market. You're trying to understand what your competitors are doing. So it's kind of part of the rubric of, of, 
of doing business in Japan. It's a really interesting aspect. But the the whole thrust of the the room last week was to reveal to everybody not the conspiracy theory, but the stuff that was act, has been actually happening. We have evidence. There there are stories about it. There are people who are have been here for a while who have their ear close to the ground. They know these stories. They're they're part of the scuttlebutt and the the just the lexicon of you know what what's what's going on in Japan. You know who who got fired for for doing something so it's it's a, a interesting component so if if the audience is is interested in delving more into that we we can look into that but uh yeah i i don't know about the yahoo and uh digital agency it's probably just a temporary situation it's available space eventually in kasumi gaseki there will be a space created for the digital agency just like there's a space for the Ministry of Caring and the Ministry of Children that will be occupied there, but those will be uh, much smaller in comparison. Oh, okay, let, let me add that, right, because uh, knowing how those guys think and uh, operate in a real real life. Yeah, so what those guys could do is that there's, first, there's no such a thing as accident, right? They didn't pick this location because it happened to be accident. They picked this for a very good reason. That's my opinion, right? Then also, what they're going to do is that now they have this one building, so who's going to be in the, around the building, you know, anybody in a car or somebody standing or walking in, they're going to take a picture and they're going to, uh, to you know, see who is, uh, who is come to whenever in the building. They're going to go through the internet and uh, bank account to see who's behind, right? Yeah, so then, uh, and if there's uh, somebody, somebody that's interesting, you just follow to see who's behind, you know. Honeypot. It's a simple operation. It's fun. <laughs> that's what we do, right? <laughs> You are a very suspicious person, Hayato. No, no, that's the way it works. <laughs> uh, knowing, uh, yeah. No, no, so that's, a, that's a real life, you know. You no, know, I... Because, uh, yeah, yeah, because, uh, you know, it's just uh, guys who approach a little fish, they don't care. Like, it could be big fish, right? Because there's no... You know, those people show up to the, this building, right? There's, and that's why, you know... And also, it's a very, very interesting location, probably, right? Because it's uh, right next to... Prime Minister's office, right? The KGB headquarters five minutes away, right in Akataka. So it's yep. a very, very fun location. So everybody's out there, right? So you just want to know who's playing, what's going on, right? Yeah. So it's it's a very very fun location, but that's the way it works, right? A lot of money at the stake, a lot of intelligence at stake, and a lot of lives at the stake, right? That's yeah, right. So that's what it is, right? So if, if anybody right. thought. If anybody thought that doing business in in Tokyo is is boring and uninteresting, it's only because you don't have your eyes open enough and you're not you're not watching carefully enough. Because you're absolutely right, this sort of thing goes on all the time, and it doesn't need to be spying. It doesn't need to be you know um, high stakes political espionage. But it's you know it's how how business is done. It's there, there's a lot of it going on. Thank you, Hayato. Thank you. Yeah, it's fun, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed, it is. It's real life with a life at the stake, so we cannot be laughing yeah. about it, right? Yeah. yeah. Somebody will come visit you, Hayato, tomorrow. Thank you <laughs> for <laughs> a perfect sense of humor, too. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed, Timothy. Thank you very much for everybody who uh, came up on stage uh, to talk with Timothy and ask questions and discuss uh, the topics of uh, today. So, um, well, this, this discussion uh, shows that all things um, uh, that are happening currently, not only in Japan, everywhere, but uh, in Japan. Interrelated. Uh, yes. So, they're, yes, they are. And also, they're connected to politics. And, um, well, um, politics actually changed their trajectory. So, um, as Dylan said, nothing is linear. Everything um, just uh, moves in different directions. Um, it is influenced by different factors and different uh, uh, events too. So um, this conversation is recorded. Last week's conversation was recorded too. The one with Robert Whiting on espionage in Japan was recorded too and they will be uploaded soon on uh, YouTube and also on Japan Expert Insights. So if you're interested in um, hearing some more insights of last week, please visit uh, either the site or the YouTube channel of Japan Expert Insights. And again, I would like to uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for coming. I would like to uh, close the room now because we are well 40 minutes be uh, beyond.
<clears throat> the initially planned time. And if you, Timothy, would you like to say a few words in closing? Um, no, I don't have much left to say. I just really appreciate um, people um, finding Japanese politics interesting enough to join us for a weekly uh, update on what's going on. I hope you find it interesting and um, intriguing, intriguing enough for you to, to want to, you know, follow it a little bit more closely. Keep your eye out for um, uh, uh, an announcement of the uh, fourth or the third uh, state of emergency. Uh, keep your eye out for Prime Minister returning and any motions he has on uh, announcing um, good things happening and what he's going to be doing. Um, it's unlikely that he's going to close the house down, but if he does, that is a huge thing and we should probably open a house quickly thereafter. But thank you very much, everybody, for joining in.